So who here has heard of stock to flow? And in the context of Bitcoin, it's a statistical model that long story short predicts 55,000 to $100,000 per Bitcoin in the next two years. Now, before your skepticism and alarm bells ring, stay tuned if you haven't heard of this model because it is pretty complicated and there's a lot of nuances and specifics that could get you to change your mind. So this video is a beginner's overview of this topic. If you haven't taken the hours that I have to dive into this to break it all down for you, then just sit back, relax, and just keep on watching. Okay, so stock to flow in a nutshell. The stock to flow ratio is the amount in reserves divided by the amount produced yearly. So all the Bitcoin out there held by people in reserves divided by the emission rate yearly, right? And so you can come up with the stock to flow ratio for gold too, because there's gold that's all out in the world and ones that are newly mined every year. So the higher the ratio means the less inflation. The higher is more scarce equals better to hold like as a store of value. So Bitcoin stock to flow ratio is lower than gold currently, but each halving or halving event makes that ratio go up. And that's why there's a lot of upside for Bitcoin. So now the big question is, the million dollar question is, does scarcity, which is modeled by this stock to flow ratio, drive value or Bitcoin's price? That's what ultimately a lot of us care about, right? So someone on Twitter called Plan B or at 100 trillion USD made an explosive post saying that he came up with a statistical model that holds, that explains all of Bitcoin's past price action, but also can use it to forecast future ones because it holds on a statistical level. So I'm just going to quote him here. He found a statistically significant relationship between stock to flow and market value exists. Also quotes, the likelihood that the relationship between stock to flow and market value is caused by chance is close to zero. So that's him running statistical tests to check if it's because of chance or if not, in which case for Bitcoin, it's not. So just starting off at kind of a TLDR about the price, what does this tell us about the price, this model? The model's BTC price is $55,000 with stock to flow ratio of 50 after the May 2020 halving. But of course, as we've seen in the past, this can lag and then overshoot the model price. So with this price of 55K, this equals roughly a market cap of 1 trillion. You may ask, where can that money come from? Well, a lot of places, institutional adoption, hyperinflation countries, silver and gold investors, and negative interest rate countries as well. Also, if you think about it, you don't need a whole $1 trillion to flow into Bitcoin to get it to that market cap, right? Because not all of it's available for sale, not all of it's circulating and on the markets. So it's a lot less of volume and demand can come through to push Bitcoin's price to that high and to have that much of an overall market cap. Also, I just want to point out that he did share some adjusted yearly data. There's some adjustments to the model, but overall it's always stood. And so it's anywhere between 55 or 50K to be simple and 100k average for that to hold between May 2020 and 2024, which is that four year halving cycle that we know Bitcoin has. So before I dive any further, I just want to say that if you enjoyed this so far, you can support me by smashing the like button and subscribing if you haven't already. So one curious thing I want to note is that this relationship can be written as a power law relationship. So this means that this model can hold through on a logarithmic scale too, right? So instead of linear, which is one, two, three, four, five, logarithm is one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, etc. Stock to flow model has held true across eight orders of magnitude, right? You know, while Bitcoin used to start at like a cent and now it's almost $10,000. And this power law relationship adds confidence, quote, that the main driver of Bitcoin value is correctly captured with stock to flow. Quote, every having Bitcoin SF doubles and market value increases 10x. This is a constant factor. So I want to point out here, like if you see on the graph to the right, this is people overlaying Bitcoin's price to avocado prices. And a lot of people are like, oh, you can find any random thing in the world that Bitcoin's correlated with, but that doesn't mean anything. But that completely is a misunderstanding of statistics because, first of all, you can't find Bitcoin correlated to anything from a power law across the entire logarithmic scale. And secondly, this is correlation that they're talking about with Bitcoin's price, where two variables move together in a certain direction, up positively or downwards for negative correlation. 
So real quick, also, I want to quickly thank our patrons, Crypto.com, and mention that there's Syndicate. This is not open to U.S. citizens, by the way, but Chainlink, they're giving 50% off on their Syndicate with a 500,000 USD allocation, and it's going to start real soon in March 3rd, some UTC time. So definitely go check them out, Crypto.com, if you're interested in that. Okay, so that's it, and now back to Stock to Flow. And the next part is, you know how I talked about correlation. That's something that we've all heard of. But what about co-integration? Marcel Berger posted on Medium twice, actually. First time he was like, I don't think Plan B's stats model holds because it's invalid because the general assumptions of ordinary least squares regressions were not met. And I highlighted that in red or underlined that in red. But then down below, he said, but spurious regression isn't always the case. Sometimes the variables might be co-integrated, which would imply the estimated relation is super consistent. And so that is in fact the case that he found out. He rescinded his objection and is now pro stock to flow and believes in it. So TLDR also from Marcel Berger's article. In an earlier analysis, I showed assumptions that should be met were not met and the resulting model therefore was flawed. In this article, I looked at the exceptional case. If I would be able to confirm that we're dealing with that specific exception, the resulting model would be validated and could be used to quantify the relation between stock to flow and Bitcoin price. It turns out that the exception indeed applies and we can use the model. So now you may be wondering what the heck is co-integration, right? Well, like I said, co correlation describes the tandem or movement of two variables like positive, they move together upwards or negative, they move downwards together. Co-integration is not about that. It means that as two variables change and vary, as two like time series data, there's a constant difference. They like drift together. So one analogy that may make sense is a drunk and his dog walking home from the bar, right? So the drunk guy can walk like randomly and the dog walks with him like back and forth on the leash, but they always go together because they have that leash component. So this is Bitcoin's daily stock to flow multiple which means like how the price differs from the true stock to flow price. Because as you know, like the halving only happens every four years. So it's like step function. It was up and then up like that. So this is Bitcoin's daily price and how far it is over or below the true stock to flow model. Because as you know, Bitcoin's price varies, right? It doesn't just stay like that for four years and then bump up all of a sudden. Since its inception, it's held within this band and always been pulled down to the zero point, which is its current stock to flow model for that particular day or time period. So Rob Wolfram also released a Medium article back testing this model. On the right hand side, you see how he takes different data points from Bitcoin's price history and then extrapolates the stock to flow model and see how history played out and how close it was to the model created from that particular slice of data. He took a lot of different slices, like first halving, second halving, in between halvings, and then only certain parts, did this really robustly and quote, his conclusion was, even the worst fitting prediction line makes a future prediction that's within the ballpark of the actual result. This gives me even more confident of the stock to flow models predictive ability. So now let's talk about some criticisms and common arguments against this. One is of course the problem at the extremes, right? Because Bitcoin's emission rate, it cuts in half. Remember, the block rewards cuts in half for miners every four years. It's going to go to zero eventually or approach zero, which means that the price is supposed to approach infinity. That's impossible, right? You may ask. Well, that's when they talk about something called hyper-Bitcoinization. You might have heard about it if you're on Twitter. And this is where like Bitcoin takes over the world and replaces all other currencies one by one. So one thing I was thinking, though, is approaching infinity. This conceptually could happen, right, if... USD value hyperinflates like crazy like Venezuela did or crashes with respect to Bitcoin's price replaced by Bitcoin altogether. Then the price could go to infinity. But this is kind of weird, right? Because Satoshi can't be Nostradamus and Bitcoin's halvings and timing can't be timed perfectly to other macro events and potentially black swan events, right? That just seems not probable. Another objection is about how stock to flow ratio and this model doesn't work for altcoins. Right, like Plan B also tried it out for Litecoin, didn't really work and didn't work at all for a lot of the other major coins out there. So the question is, it works for gold, silver and Bitcoin. Why not all coins? Right. And the theory is that there needs to be a set of conditions that need to be just right, called unforgeable costliness for this model to hold for other commodities or potentially coins. 
So you can't just create a new coin with a lower emission rate to Bitcoin and consider it to have more value or will be more valuable. It's the stock that needs to be valuable, not the production rate. So maybe there needs to be a bar for decentralization. That's something that they were tossing around on Twitter. Another interesting objection per se is a parallel universe thought experiment. And this is from an article by Alephbit. They said to imagine a parallel universe where Satoshi made the same Bitcoin, but with a different issuance schedule. So keep the max cap, have the fixed issuance of 10 Bitcoin for every 10 minutes per block reward. For the first case and the second case, a market flood of 90% of all Bitcoins in the first year, followed by a fixed issuance of the remaining coins up to 21 million. In both of these scenarios, at some point in these parallel universe Bitcoins, they would get to the same stock to flow ratio as it is today. But you can argue that those other cases would fail due to lack of adoption, right? The first one, it wouldn't create sufficient interest since it will take a lot of time to reach an interesting level of scarcity. And number two, it'd probably concentrate all the Bitcoin in mega whales pockets and thus make it too hard for new people to come in and make it worth it for them like miners, investors, and so forth. So that's really interesting. Those two would have the same stock to flow as present day Bitcoin in some case, pretty much say that those two wouldn't succeed and that only Satoshi's model that he put out for present day Bitcoin would work. What are my objections with these objections? They're all logic based objections and they make sense. Don't get me wrong. But what about the stats, right? These statistical points that I told you earlier, are they just trying to say that it's an insanely massive coincidence or we should just ignore it completely? I don't buy that, to be honest, because after all, Plan B or the creator of this model didn't set out to find this. He stumbled upon it after searching a lot of other models like the log regression model and disproved those. He also welcomes people actively to disprove his statistical model. He'd gladly like revoke it or push it aside if it's proven to have some problems with the stats, right? So moving forward, we're going to see our first out of sample point. And what that means is stats models use past data to forecast the future, right? That's what we've been doing with the stat model. In sample means all the data we currently have. Out of sample means data we don't have, but we're trying to forecast. So the model predicts around 55K after the halving, but doesn't reach 100% of that until well after. So quote, this has to hold true for this model to hold. And plan B says 2021 model value of 50 to 100K will be critical to the validity of this model. And this is like the first out of sample data points. So what are my final thoughts on this? I believe this will hold at least for one to two more halving cycles. The stats make sense. And if stat person watching this wants to disagree, then please let us know why down in the comments below. So should you max out your credit cards? Probably not. And I'm never one to give financial advice on this channel, but now is a great time to get in my opinion, invest responsibly. And also this model is not a guarantee, even though I think it's predictive, it makes sense and it actually works. It has forecasting value, not a guarantee. Anything can happen. A black swan event could happen and so forth. What do you think about the stock to flow model? I hope this cleared things up and was beginner friendly enough for all of you watching. As always, you can support me by smashing the like button, subscribing down below, and why not check out these videos up here to find out more. This is Kevin. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and I'll catch you guys next time.